Today's A-level, standard level IB video is on microscopes. Now, microscopy is a topic which varies hugely between the exam boards. This video is trying to cover as much detail as possible because I feel like it's always better to have too much rather than too little, but do be aware of what you need for your exam board to make sure you're learning the right stuff. However, when we look at microscopy, we are looking at both the light and electron microscope, and we're gonna talk a bit about how they both work their various advantages and disadvantages, the difference between magnification and resolution, and clearly we need to do some calculations involving those so that we can actually do the mathematical part of the biology paper. So first of all, what is the point of a microscope? Well, clearly it's to enable us to see very small objects in much greater detail. So starting with the light microscope, it's called a light microscope because it uses light in order to view the sample. A compound microscope is another name for it and that's simply because each of its lenses contains more than one lens. But there are three main lenses you may or may not need to be aware of. The first one is the eyepiece lens, the objective lens and the condenser lens and the role of the condenser lens is to focus the light before it even hits the sample. Now be aware that the sample clearly needs to be very, very thin and that's to enable the light to pass through it. And there are two types of preparation or two types of sample that we can view in a light microscope and that is a temporary preparation and a permanent preparation. So temporary preparation you might have done yourself at school, maybe using red onion. So you use a scalpel to obtain a very thin layer which you then put a dot of water on, cover with a very thin glass cover slip and then you can view it. A permanent preparation is one where the water has been removed and it's been replaced with a firmer substance which has then been set using resin. And they're the ones you tend to get that come out of like a suitcase that you can look at. Let's look in a bit more detail at the light microscope. So say we have an eyepiece lens whose lens can magnify up to 10 times and then we have an objective lens that can magnify up to another 10 times. That means we have a total magnification of 100 times. So we can theoretically see that object 100 times larger than it is. However, although you can theoretically and definitely keep magnifying up your samples, you'll get to a point where you can't see it clearly, and that's all to do with resolution. And resolution is the ability to distinguish between two separate points. So if you can't distinguish two separate points and they appear as one object, that means that the resolution isn't good enough. And that's the biggest problem with light microscopes. They do not have great resolving power. And that's actually due to the wavelength of light simply being too long and it can't pass between the two objects. And we say that its resolution is limited to 0.2 micrometers. So that means if you have a sample that has objects closer together than 0.2 micrometers, you simply won't be able to see them and you'll see them as one object. And that's where the electron microscope comes in because it has a much greater resolving power. The reason we first started using electron microscopes is obviously due to the limitations of resolving power with light microscopes. The wavelength of light was simply too long, so they had to look at another type of radiation in order to take over its job. So they looked at a radiation which would have a shorter wavelength, and that's where the electron microscope was invented, because electrons have extremely short wavelengths. Their resolving power is insane, it is 5 nanometers, so that means they can distinguish between two points extremely close together. So what happens here is an electron gun fires a beam of electrons at the sample, which is then picked up by a fluorescent screen. Do notice this has to occur inside a vacuum. The reason being that the air particles would collide with the electron beam and disrupt them and deflect them. So we need to have a complete vacuum containing no air. There are two types of electron microscopes you might need to know about. The first one is the transmission electron microscope. The second is the scanning electron microscope. Do notice that the main advantage of the scanning electron microscope is that it can produce 3D images. So looking more generally at the advantages and disadvantages of light versus electron microscopes, you tend to find that the advantages of one is the disadvantages of the other. So, for example, a light microscope's advantage is that you can view living samples. Electron microscopes, they have to be dead. A light microscope can see real colour, so natural colour, whereas electron microscopes produce black and white images which later have to be coloured up using dyes. And then we've got the point that light microscope is nice and cheap, it's portable, it's user friendly. Electron microscopes are extremely expensive and they're really found in very specialist places. Obviously preparation is extremely easy with light microscopes, it can be carried out by us, so students, people like me who have no expertise with microscopes. Electron microscopes require very specialist users. 
But then obviously the disadvantage of the light microscope is its resolving power. The fact that it can only distinguish 0.2 micrometers, whereas the electron microscope has the amazing advantage of being able to resolve between 5 nanometers. And I've already touched on this, but remember the scanning electron microscope can produce 3D images, a light microscope can only produce 2D images, and just make a general comment about the fact you can see cell structures far more detailed in an electron microscope. Right, I'm now going to switch to talking about converting units. I'm going to show you how to do that first of all because it is essential that you convert your units to micrometers accurately and then I'll show you some past exam questions. So lots of people struggle with converting units and I wanted to give you a really straightforward way of doing this. So let, let's have a look down here. We've got lots of different scientifically approved units. So we've got the picometer, which most of you won't come across, but I've just added it there for completeness sake. Then we have the nanometer here, which is far more likely to come up. Micrometer, millimeter, which you'll be familiar with because you'll have that on your rulers. Meter, which is obviously much larger than that. You might have wooden meter-long rulers in your science lab, but you won't really come across them apart from there. Kilometers, that's very straightforward because we know kilometers. How many kilometers is it to the beach? Five. And then lastly, megameter here, which you probably haven't come across. So what I'm trying to show you here is you can use this simple expedient of times in by a thousand to convert between the various steps. So to get from millimeters to micrometers, simply times by a thousand. To get from micrometers to nanometers, times by a thousand. It obviously works the other way around. If you need to get from nanometers here to micrometers here, divide by a thousand. But I didn't want to make this diagram too complicated. So as long as you know what you're doing, you can obviously reverse it. And I'm going to show you some examples right now. So let's start by converting five meters to micrometers. So let's have a look in our table and we need to times by a thousand twice. And then just write out your answer now. So it becomes five million micrometers. We're now converting three millimeters to micrometers. So we're going from here to here so we just need to times by a thousand. So we're just times in by a thousand once. Next up, converting 10 centimeters to nanometers. This is more complicated because we've got centimeters, which isn't included here. So let's first of all convert centimeters to millimeters. Hopefully that's really straightforward for you because again, you have a ruler. It says 10 centimeters on it and you'll be able to work out from your ruler that one centimeter is 10 millimeters. So therefore 10 centimeters is going to be 100 millimeters. And then we're just looking back at our little table thing and we need to see how we're getting from millimeters to nanometers and we're timesing by a thousand twice. And let's just add some little commas to try and make that make more sense. So that's 100 million nanometers. And now we're going to go the other way. So we're converting 22 micrometers to millimeters. So this time we need to divide by 1,000. So 22 micrometers is 0.022 millimeters. So now we're going to practice what we've just learned and we're going to start by looking at question one on the right hand side. The diagram below shows the general structure of an animal cell as seen under an electron microscope. Calculate the magnification of the image and show your working. So let's start by writing our formula triangle out. That does not look like a triangle. So it's I am, which means that magnification equals the image size over the actual size. The easiest way to do this is not actually measure the diameter of the cell. You need to use this scale bar here. We can see from the scale bar that its size is 5 micrometers. So we're going to put that there as the actual size. In terms of the image size, you're going to use your ruler to measure the length of that line here. I know it's hard because I'm doing it on the iPad, but let me tell you that it is 17 millimeters. Now, the important thing with these calculations is to get all the units being the same. So remember I just taught you how to convert. So if you actually look back in the video, you can see this. But to get from millimeters to micrometers, remember you times by a thousand. So let's convert 17 millimeters to micrometers by adding three noughts, divide it by five, 
and you get a magnification which is 3400 times as big. Next up, we're calculating the length of structure G, which is a mitochondria, show you're working. So we're looking for its actual length. So using our formula triangle, we see that we do image size over magnification. So the image size, you're going to use your ruler to measure the length of. So let's do that. And we find that it is 12 millimeters long. Again, just trust me on this one because it's going to be impossible for you to measure. Then we're dividing it by the magnification, which we've just calculated is 3400. The crucial thing here is you must have your units in micrometers. So again, using our conversion, we're going to times that by 1,000. So it becomes 12,000 divided by 3,400 to become an actual length of 3.53 micrometers. Now we're calculating the diameter of structure B, which is the nucleolus. That's the small subcompartment of the nucleus. Show your working. So that's a really nice similar calculation to what we've just done. So use your ruler to measure its diameter in millimeters and that will be eight millimeters the magnification remains 3400 convert eight millimeters to micrometers do the division and you get an answer which is 2.35 micrometers the photograph shows part of the cytoplasm of a cell the magnification of this image is 200,000 calculate the actual width of the organelle x show you're working so as always using our triangle i am we're looking for the actual length so that's going to be image size over magnification so let's substitute in the magnification first of all because that's nice and straightforward you're going to use your ruler now to work out the width it's the width not the length of organelle x so do that in millimeters and you'll get an answer which is 20 millimeters i like to keep my units in so i know what's going on we're converting that to micrometers as per usual, so that becomes 20,000 divided by 200,000, giving us a value which is 0 0.1 micrometers. This photograph was taken using a transmission electron microscope. The structure of the organelles visible in the photograph could not have been seen using an optical light microscope. Explain why. And the most obvious answer here is because the resolution isn't high enough, and the reason is due to the wavelength of light being too long. Scientists use optical microscopes and transmission electron microscopes, TEMs, to investigate cell structure. Explain the advantages and limitations of using a TEM to investigate cell structure. It's a nice, straightforward fact recall question. It's worth five marks, so give five separate points. So first of all, advantages are that very small objects can be viewed and that the TEM has a high resolution, and that's due to the fact that the wavelengths of electrons are much shorter than that of a light wave. Disadvantages, however, is that the specimens, of course, must be dead, so you can't look at living cells. It must occur within a vacuum, obviously, because we don't want the air particles colliding with those electrons. And lastly, remember, it produces a black and white image, which requires colouring up afterwards. I hope you found this video really helpful. Don't forget to sub if you haven't already, and do give it a like, and I'll be back soon. Bye, guys.